It's so good to be back here at First Church. So good to be back in this sanctuary. Please, won't you pray with me? May the love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts all flight to all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, be in me and around me, now and always. Amen. Amen. So I have a confession to make. And as I say those words, I'm reminded that this is not the first time that I'm preaching that I start a sermon with I have a confession to make. I absolutely love, love, love Easter. I especially love Easter worship. It is hands down my most favorite Christian holiday. Actually, it's my most favorite holiday period ever since I was a kid. Better than Christmas, better than Thanksgiving, even better than the 4th of July. Being in church on Easter is always magnificent. There's singing and choirs and organ and trumpets. Who doesn't love Christ the Lord is risen today? The pomp, the glory, the triumph. Leaving worship on Easter is like looking God right in the eye. It's like being on a faith high. However, Holy Week is tough. It's draining both physically and emotionally. You have the Last Supper. You have the washing of the feet. You have the betrayal. You have the trial, followed by the trip to Golgotha with the cross, the crucifixion, and the death. Then there's the sadness on Saturday of death. Then boom, Sunday morning, and the tomb is empty all of that hard work finally paying off. I clearly remember last year's Easter here at First, uh, First Church. We shot off streamers from the balcony, uh, from a cannon in the balcony. There were balloons and timpani and trumpets, and Sarah and I were perched precariously on the bench behind us, ready to unfurl a banner at the exact right moment. And although last Sunday's virtual Easter service had a little bit less pomp, it was nonetheless a goosebumps on your arm type of service. Christ the Lord is risen indeed. So that you would think now with all the hard stuff over, it's behind us, it's smooth sailing from here on in for at least a couple of weeks. But no, not so much. It's sometimes easy to forget that the disciples experiencing that first Easter was quite different than we experience it today. There was no Easter bunny or colored eggs or jelly beans. The first Easter found Jesus' followers frightened, confused, and locked in a room together. And there was doubt. There was plenty of doubt. Had they made a huge mistake following this person, Jesus? Had they put their lives in jeopardy? What the heck was going on here? And on top of it all, the body was missing. What were they to believe? Today's reading from John starts on that very first Easter Sunday. But remember, Jesus had appeared to, Mir to Mary in the garden earlier. And when she told the disciples about it, they were like, yeah, right. What is she on? And here's when Jesus appears for the first time to his disciples in the locked room where they can see the wounds on his hands and his side. Imagine how petrified they were. But Jesus says, peace be with you. And the disciples realize that this is the real deal. This is the Messiah and they believe. But there was one disciple that was missing. And if I were to put myself in that story, that would be me. I probably would have bolted, afraid for my life, afraid that I had made a big, big mistake. Given the circumstances that these disciples were facing, my doubt, I'm sure, would have overwhelmed me and caused me to flee. So Thomas wasn't there the first time Jesus appear appeared. Maybe he was running away. Maybe he got hung up in traffic, or maybe he was shopping. 
Who knows? What we do know is that when he returned, the other disciples tell him that Jesus was there. Thomas, you're not going to believe this. Guess who you just missed? Imagine how Thomas must have felt right then. Were his friends pulling his leg? Were they playing a prank on him? And if it were true, why hadn't Jesus stuck around until he returned so that he could see for himself? And he doesn't believe them. Thomas tells them, unless I see for myself and can touch his wounds, I won't believe. And this is where I believe doubting Thomas gets a bum rap. Remember, it was Mary who first tells the disciples that she had seen the risen Jesus, and it's not until they see his wounds that they believe. So Thomas was not the only doubter in the group. They all needed proof positive that Jesus had risen. The one thing I know about doubt is that it can be a powerful force that can drive our lives. It can make us give up. It could make us give up our dreams, make us not believe because we cannot see. My own decision to come to First Church to do an internship was driven completely by doubt. Doubt about the stories in the scriptures. Doubt about this thing called Christianity. And most importantly, doubt about the existence of a real God. So when I tell you I would have been the one not in that room, I mean it. I would be ever known as, forever known as Doubting Mark. My suspicion is that many of us would be in that same boat. But this Doubting Thomas has always been one of my favorites. He's the one in the story that I can most relate to, and he's the one that speaks to me most clearly. He's the one that makes it okay for us to live between faith and doubt. To live between faith and doubt. I think we often have the tendency to think of faith and doubt as opposites. If you have faith, there is no doubt. Or if you have doubt, there certainly can't be faith. But really, faith and apathy are more opposite than faith and doubt. I see, faith, I see doubt as an integral part of our faith journey. It is a stop along the way that most of us make many, many times in our lives. At times of crisis, at times of pain, at times of grief, at times when we are at our lowest, doubt sneaks in and causes us, challenges us to realign. Doubt is not an indication of being a bad person or a bad Christian or a bad person of faith. Doubt is an indication that we are taking our relationship with God seriously, that we are being honest with ourselves and are willing to start or continue our journey without knowing exactly where we're going. Doubt is a piece of that jigsaw puzzle that we call faith. And Doubting Thomas was much like that. He questioned, had doubts, but ultimately went on to spread the good news of Jesus' message of love. Christian tradition has it that Thomas set sail for India and was the first to spread that message there. It was his doubt and his desire to know who Jesus really was that brought him faith. And that faith propelled him forward, touching many, many lives. And so that's all well and good. Thomas was lucky. He was able to see Jesus, touch him, and get to know him in ways that you and I can't. What hope is there for me? What hope is there for you? During a class at Union, we read a book about a woman. This woman was in her 30s when she had an undeniable experience with the divine. She knew God was present and felt God calling her to do something big, to do something new and scary, and something hard. She had the sort of spiritual experience that most of us want, most of us yearn for, as proof. Proof that there is a God. Proof that we're doing it right. Proof that will allow us not to doubt our faith. So this woman did go out, and for the next 50 years, she did amazing things. 
She worked among the poor. She brought hope to the sick, and she showed the world what love and compassion can accomplish. But inside, she doubted. She wrestled with her faith. She had what Christian writers call a dark night of the soul. She even questioned the existence of God. In the context of today's sto excuse me, story, we could call her Doubting Teresa. The Mother Teresa that most of us see as living a saint-like life, saint -like life. Whenever I saw a picture of her, I always thought, wow, she's so holy. She's so full of faith. She's so certain of what she's doing. When in reality, she was plagued by uncertainty, plagued by doubt, plagued by wondering if what she was doing was really making a difference. In reality, Mother Teresa was just like us. She was just like Thomas. Or maybe it's because of her doubt that she had faith. We all doubt, all of us on this journey of faith, who are honest with ourselves, doubt. As I've said earlier, doubt is not a one-time stop. We get shaken up, we don't believe, we question, we wonder where this God is, and sometimes even feel guilty about our doubt. Which makes me wonder how Thomas managed that first week. Why couldn't he just accept what the other disciples had told him? What made him want to see for himself? And I wonder what brought him back the next Sunday. I wonder if he thought about not going back, now known as the doubter. And yet, and yet, he went back. Maybe he went back to prove to himself. Maybe he went back not convinced it was true. Maybe he went back because it was easier than being alone and he needed his community. Maybe he went back because he missed his pals. Maybe he went back because he thought that just maybe, just maybe, Jesus would return. For whatever reason, Thomas went back to his community, to his friends, at the moment of his greatest doubt. Just as many of us continue to return here, hoping that this God of love will show up. And God always does. Doubt can be the thing that propels us to faith. Doubt can be what shakes us up. It can be what pushes us out of our comfort zone and to create a new and better place. Doubt can be our ticket on that faith train that traverses hills and valleys, that crosses spectacular vistas, that brings us on that exciting journey even when we don't know where we're going. Doubt can be a sign not of the absence of God, but the sign that God is doing something wonderful and miraculous in our lives. I love the fact that Jesus returns to Thomas the following week. It gives me hope. It's not a one-shot deal. It wasn't, oh well, you weren't here, you missed it. And it wasn't too bad, you're just gonna have to trust the others. It was the God of love giving Thomas another chance. Another chance to see, another chance to believe. And I do believe that we get second and third and fourth chances. That we are challenged again and again, yet God continues to show up. And when we are ready, when our hearts are open to the possibility, we see and we believe. Until then, God never stops coming back again and again and again. Thank goodness for that. Actually, thank God for that. Amen.